Joseph Lofthouse is an independent plant breeder. Um, I had the pleasure to first listen to Joseph present at the NOFA New York conference last year. Um, and I must say diversity in seeds is very, very important. And diversity in humans is also very, very important. And um, I think that uh, Joseph has a photograph in his bio of a pile of seed. But I think if I was to think of us all as members of the seed network ecosystem, maybe Joseph would be a dandelion with those seeds blowing in the wind and deep-rooted, nutritious roots below him. Uh, and he's self-described as a breeder. Uh, who breeds promiscuously, pollinating land-raised crops for low-input, subsistence-level agricultural systems. And I find his approach very inspiring. It reminds me, when I, when I hear him talk, I think it just, I can feel how much, as humans, we psychologically like to control things. We like things to be uniform, predictable, um, consistent, and sometimes uh, we can all benefit from liberating our own concepts around what uh, embracing diversity, liberating diversity, as Veronique says. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Joseph to, to share his story. So when I look out at this room, I see my family. So many of you are growing seeds that came out of my garden, or I'm growing seeds that came out of your gardens. And that feels really good. That's diversity that's spread across the country, across the ecosystems. And we're all part of that, and we're all, you know, some of you have done work in your gardens with my seed that I can't do because of the climate. And like someone crossed my squash with seminal pumpkins. I can't grow a seminal pumpkin, but somebody can, and those genetics came to my garden because of the community, because of the interaction that we're having with each other. And I love the grow reports that you send, and they make me so happy. And, and when you tell me about a flavor in a tomato that's just, woo, I'm like, oh, I know that flavor. And it, it, anyway, it's just delightful. So, so thank you all for that. Let's try this. Whoa. <laughs> OK. So this, this is basically what I'd like to talk about is land races. And the reason I originally started growing land races is because I live in a mountain valley. The snow on those mountains stays there until August. And that cold air is coming down into my garden all summer long, all winter long. And so if I plant a crop that I get from the seed companies, I might have 75% failure rate. On tomatoes, I have like a 95% failure rate. There's just not enough heat in my garden for the warm, the warm weather crops. Um, so when I became a market farmer, I basically had two choices. I had seeds from the the mega seed companies, which are really designed for average conditions and average gardeners, so they can send them anywhere in the country and they'll do okay. And then I, I had the heirlooms that I could grow, which were generated for somebody far away, a long time ago, 50 years ago. My conditions aren't anything like that farm either. And so I basically couldn't pick up a seed catalog and get anything that was of value to me as a farmer. And so I had to start growing my own seed. So this was the first um, land race crop that I became familiar with. And I was just a, a market farmer that was looking for something different for my customers. And I thought it would be nice if there was some colored corn that I could take to market with me. And this was a corn that was developed by Alan Bishop in Pekin, Indiana. And what he did is he took 200 varieties of sweet corn 
and he planted them all together and let them promiscuously cross-pollinate. And so when they got to my farm, some of them grew this tall and the pheasants ate them up. Some of them grew this tall and, and were beautiful plants. Some of them didn't even germinate in the clay soil, but many of them germinated and grew just wonderful. Um, much better than the commercial seed that I had been planting. And so, so I saved seeds from those and in the second year they were even more fabulous because they were becoming locally adapted to my farm. And there was enough genetic diversity in them that they could, they could solve all of those sorts of problems with the soil and the, and the insects and the pheasants that by themselves without me providing materials or labor or chemicals to solve those problems for the seeds. And after I grew this crop for two years, I decided that every crop that I grow would be that style of crop. They would be genetically diverse, promiscuously pollinating, and locally adapted. And so this was the first squash crop that I tried to grow. Um, Things I want to point out in it is there's this little pumpkin there, the round pumpkin, and there's also the squash with the green, green skins on them, and we'll, we'll see those later on. But the year I planted these, the growing season was um, 88 days long, and so the fruits that were harvested were all immature. They were all green fruits. They really didn't taste good but they produced seeds that were viable enough that I could plant them the next year. And so also on the list I put spinach because if I buy a variety of spinach from the, from the seed catalogs, about half of them will grow this tall for me and then they'll flower. You know, and, and some of them will be these great big beautiful plants. And so it's really easy to just see in the first year what's going to grow well for me. All right, that pointer doesn't seem to be working. So this is my definition here of a modern land race. It's genetically diverse, it's locally adapted, and it's promiscuously pollinating. As much as the crop can promiscuously pollinate. For example, beans might only pollinate at 1%. But if you pay attention, you can find those naturally occurring hybrids and make sure they go back into your population. So there, there is always some degree in just about every crop of promiscuous pollination. But for quickest results, the crops that are more promiscuous, like the, the squash, adapt quicker to my conditions than a species like um, tomatoes that might only pollinate or cross-pollinate 5% of the time. Okay, the, the thing that was most surprising to me when I started breeding my own varieties is you get what you select for. And, and one of the things that I always select for is great taste. And if I'm having a musk melon, I want to smell it and I want it to seep into my whole body and just bring me joy. And when I taste it, I want it to drool down my chin because it's just so, such a beautiful experience to me as, a, as an animal. And, and so inadvertently, well, I was intentionally selecting for taste, but also I select for productivity because something has to reproduce in my garden before I can even think about growing it into the, into the future. And so on the inadvertent selection, for example, I've discovered that the oranger color of squash is, the more I, it pleases me as a human. And so I was, so at first I was inadvertently selecting for the orange color, and then I'm like, oh, that is why that tastes so good. And so 
so my squash have ended up becoming just super orange and super tasty. And with that, and I, because I'm a small scale farmer, I can taste every fruit, every generation before I save seeds from it. And then I don't have these mystery like delicatas that get poison in them and they market it to 10,000 customers without ever knowing it. Okay, so here's my squash about five years later after that first photo. They all matured, they all got ripe. If you look up in the corner, there's still the orange pumpkin hanging around. The genetic diversity is still there. There's still squash with the green skins. The, the genetic diversity is still there, but I'm also selecting for traits that are, are really pleasing to me. Um, since this photo was taken, I've, I've selected for more of the, the long neck squash because that's what my chefs like. And so, so then we have a community, me, my chefs, our, the people that eat our food, that really value that long neck trait. And so that's becoming a local, a local custom, a local trait that, that's very much associated with our community and the way we like to do things. And for you guys, when, it, when seed goes out to your community, you're going to select for what is valuable to you and what you find um, appealing. And then you're going to send seed back to us and you know, so we, in that way, we preserve the genetic diversity. You, you know, each in our own way, in our own time, and yet together, it creates a tremendously a diverse food system. Okay, so um, I went to a seed conference recently, and. A lady brought, Lisa Bloodnick, in case any of you know her, <laughs> brought seeds, and she brought a thousand varieties of bean seed. Each one of them was in a little packet, in little cases, and the whole two tables were covered with cases of beans. And, and she said that she'd brought a thousand varieties of beans. And, the, and then she teased me and said, I'd also brought a thousand varieties of beans. But my thousand variety of beans were all in one bottle, okay? And, and there's room for both kinds of diversity. Um, at my place, I like simple and easy. And so, so for me, they can all grow together. And, they, and at any time I wanted, I could separate one of those beans out and grow it as a separate variety. But for, for me, Personally, I, I like the diversity. I like the, the taste of each color has a slightly different taste. And when you put them all together, it's like, oh, yeah. OK, so, so it can be super easy not to have to worry about purity or isolation distances. Grow what you love. Save seeds from what you love. Um, and. If your neighbors love something similar or different or their pollen gets into your crops, whatever, you can reselect. We'll, we'll have questions in a minute. <laughs> okay, so, so one way that I, I monitor diversity of my beans, for example, is I sorted out 100 beans in one pile and 100 beans in the other pile. And between those, there's about 40 varieties of beans. But there's also those two varieties, a pink bean and a pinto bean, that if I didn't uh, plant fewer of those, they would come to predominate the, my local land race because they, do, they really thrive for me. Um, because I'm sharing seed with, with the world, I like to keep as much diversity as possible. And so I grow fewer of the pink beans and the pinto beans for what I'm, what I'm sharing. But if I was growing only for food for my local community, I'd focus mostly on the, the beans that did the best. And they, when I grow them just as a, 
as a mix of beans, they self-select for what really thrives in my garden. So, you know, I don't have to pay a lot of attention to that. Okay, so what happens to the DNA when we start being promiscuous about our growing? <laughs> okay, th this I prepared for tomatoes. Um, a regular, if you, make, if you cross a regular domestic tomato, what you're going to get after about four generations is you're going to get genetics that look like the bottom graph. Is they, they're mostly recombining into just a, a static um, genetic pattern. Where if you, if you grow promiscuous tomatoes, which I'll talk about tomorrow, um, what you end up getting is the, the genetics are rearranging in every generation and they're constantly shifting. And what that constant shifting does botanically is that each one of those new genetic combinations is a new way to deal with the bugs, the diseases, the soil, the farmer. And so every time the genetics rearrange, you get a chance to find something really great. And if the plants are doing that kind of work for me, then I don't have to do it as a farmer. I don't have to put in the labor. I don't have to put in the, the materials, the poisons, whatever it is, to try to overcome the genetic deficiencies. OK, how to get my varieties. The best way is to make your own. OK, you can make genetically diverse varieties on your farm that are locally adapted, that are your community seeds. Um, and that, that's a really good way that I recommend first and foremost. Um, Experimental Farm Network is um, distributing my seed this year. And one thing about buying a land race that already pre-exists, even if it's not locally adapted to your environment, they often have enough genetic diversity in them that something in that population will thrive for you. And then you can start from there to, to go forward. Um, I'm attending the seed swap tomorrow afternoon. Come see me there. And I would like to thank the, the people that support my work. And, and that's World Tomato Society. They paid for me to come to this conference. Um, Experimental Farm Network uh, freed up my time because they're distributing my seed. and and. The Open Source Seed Initiative has been a, a beautiful inspiration to me over the years. Um, Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance is the, the first organization that came to my farm and brought a driver and took me away. And <laughs> so thank you for them. And, <laughs> and thank you, Organic Seed Alliance, for the opportunity to speak today. All right. A couple of questions, at least. <coughs> Please come to the mic if you are going to ask a question. Go ahead. Hi. Hi, here you go. Hello. Wait. Hi. Uh, just a quick question on the land race, modern land race breeding. So with the, the, um, the beans, don't the different varieties of beans have different cooking times? Whatever. Whatever. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean... <laughs> Um, and, and the second question, the second question around the, the squash is when, when you're doing, uh, when you choose the, the, the varieties you, you want to freely cross, are you going to, um, I guess, what's your, you know, what's, you have parameters, you have filters to choose these parental lines, or do you just cross, you know, a Maxima and another species or Hubbard with a complete other, uh, uh, you know, a non-Hubbard variety. I, I, I guess how, how, how far do you go in the diversity of, of parental lines? So, thank you. Um, regarding the beans, I love that they have different cooking times because you'll have some beans in a pot that are turned to mush immediately and some that are firm. 
and it, it adds a wonderful texture and flavor to a pot of beans. And as far as choosing parent lines, I'm going to share the grand secret of plant breeding with you. And this has been known for 10,000 years, and it's what all of the illiterate plant breeders used to bring us all of the varieties that we're currently growing. Plants make seeds. Um, offspring tend to resemble their parents and their grandparents, and sometimes a trait skips a generation. And if you know those things, you know everything you need to know about plant breeding. And, and so you get what you start with. If you start with a bitter squash, you're going to get bitter offspring. If you start with a great squash, you're going to tend to get great offspring. And sometimes in my plant breeding, I've went really far wild. Like one year, I imported a trait in muskmelons for bitter fruit. I threw away my whole year's worth of seed because I couldn't risk having a bitter muskmelon. But, but for the most part, you get what you, you know, children resemble their, their parents and their grandparents. Mm -hmm. I grow uh, open pollinated corn, chickpeas, dry beans, a lot of different kinds of beans. And just in the last uh, five years now, we've begun to notice a strange, strange trait to me with phaseolus. They can regenerate from their roots. Nice. Yeah, let's rock and roll. Because uh -huh. it's that, that perennialism that, excuse me, that I've always been after uh, with a really diverse ecology from my farm, you know, uh -huh. but, but ha have you ever experienced that where, you know, you cut your beans and leave them over winter, you don't tear the roots up, and lo and behold, next spring they start popping out. So I've been noticing some perenniality with fava beans in my garden, and that would be oh. a trait that, that would be useful to me, you know, that, that I would long to have. <laughs> and, and as we're doing our own plant breeding, it's really important to watch for those kind of traits. You know, what, um, like one of my collaborators found a perennial tomato. Woo! You know, and just if we watch those things, we can find lots of new ways to do lots of new things that aren't currently being done in our, our current seed system. I also have heard runner beans can do that. Yes. Yeah. Um, another That's trait that runner beans have is, is they might have a tuber that you could eat like a potato. You know, who's exploring that? Um, I have a question related to that, sort of. Um, you mentioned your promiscuous tomatoes. I'm wondering, in other self-pollinating crops, if you've done, tried a lot to select for cross-pollinating and how much success you've had and um, how sort of, you know, heritable that seems to be. So... If I, if I just pay attention to what's going on in my garden and I take the, the occasional cross-pollinating bean and I plant that preferentially, I'm inadvertently or intentionally selecting for beans that have more promiscuous flowers. You know, and so over the years, the population is constantly moving in, in that direction. Any more questions? Okay, I guess um, I'm gonna go ahead and pull up the next uh, presentation here. I guess my last question for Joseph would be, um, in the time that you've embraced yourself as a plant breeder, mm -hmm. I'm wondering um, if you've seen a, sh a shift in your conversations with other people about what is plant breeding and conversations about that. And I think that, you know, your, your approach to farming in this way um, has been an inspiration for many others. I also see a similar trend in the scientific community that we have papers and research going on around the concept of evolutionary plant breeding, mm -hmm. um, whether we make very highly diverse 
populations and then breed out of that and, and thinking more critically about when do we apply human intervention and when don't we, and what traits are important for uniformity and what aren't. And I think mm -hmm. this is a, an exciting area of, of, of expanding our concept of breeding. Um, and on that note, I just want to mention that Julianne Kellogg has a poster presentation. She'll be there tonight on evolutionary approaches in quinoa breeding, and she'd be a good resource to talk to about some of that population development. But I'll leave you with that comment, and you're welcome to keep talking while I pull up the next talk. Okay. Um, so my idea of plant breeding is that you, if you're saving seeds, you're a plant breeder. Even if you're trying to save them inbreed, you're still a plant breeder because stuff is happening that we don't really control and the mere fact that we're saving seeds means we're plant breeding. Um, when I was growing tomatoes, I had inadvertently selected for a vine architecture, which was an arching vine because it kept the tomatoes out of the dirt. And I hadn't, I hadn't I was just saving tomato seeds, but really what I was doing is I was selecting for tomatoes that weren't muddy when I saved the seed from them. And that meant the arching vine. And, and so my definition of plant breeding is if you're saving seeds, you're, you're a plant breeder whether you know it or not. And thank you everyone for coming out and what a beautiful time together.